You can't just say Trump bad, orange man bad, orange man fascist. You must vote for Democrats because it's not going to work. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. And this week, we're checking in with yet another group of voters that could decide the 2024 election, Hispanic voters. After Trump spent his term pushing for a border wall and separating children from families, to say nothing of his comments during the 2016 campaign around Mexicans being rapists and thieves, it seemed inconceivable that Trump would do better with Hispanics in 2020 than he did in 2016. But against all odds, he did. If you only count the major party candidates, Trump got 36% of the Hispanic vote in 2020, up from 29% in 2016, according to Catalyst data. A lot of that was due to the fact that 30% more Hispanics voted in 2020 than in 2016, something that's certainly reflected in our focus groups. Behind all of these shifts are real voters, and today you're going to hear from some of them. You're also going to hear from some Biden voters who are considering abandoning the Democrats in 2024. My guest today is my friend, Rui Teixeira, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, co-founder and politics editor of The Liberal Patriot, and co-author with John Judas of the forthcoming book, Where Have All the Democrats Gone? The Soul of the Party in the Age of Extremes. Rui, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Sarah. Okay, so your book's coming out November 7th. It's about the Democratic Party's decline in support among working class voters. Uh, we're going to drop the link to pre-order a copy in our show notes for everyone that's interested in grabbing their own copy. Uh, uh -huh. But you lay out a blueprint for the Democrats to be more of a working class friendly party than they are now. So what lessons does history leave for Democrats right here in this moment? Well, right at this moment, I think, uh, you know, since our, our, our subject of today's uh, discussion is Hispanics, I think that looking at uh, the trends among Hispanic voters and the um, opinions, the views, the inclinations of Hispanic voters provides an important lesson. As you pointed out, the Democrats lost, you know, roughly 16 margin points among uh, Hispanics between 2016 and 2020, despite all the stuff you mentioned about Trump. That's telling you a lot. And it was bigger, substantially bigger among working class Hispanics than it was among college educated Hispanics. And of course, Hispanics are overwhelmingly working class uh, constituency. And if you look at how they're trending now in recent uh, polling, I mean, we, we see those margins actually, you know, again, we don't know what's going to happen in the election, but judging from the polling, those margins for the Democrats are, are coming down even further. Uh, we've seen polls where the Democrats are only up like 5, 10, 15 points among, among Hispanics. And we also see that most Hispanics don't think the Biden administration has accomplished uh, little or nothing during its time in office. We see that they give Biden an absolutely terrible rating on inflation, on immigration, on the economy, you name it. These are not happy campers, and they don't see the Democratic Party and the administration of Joe Biden as necessarily having done stuff that's in their interests. And then, you know, there's a wide panoply of cultural issues that we talk about a lot in the book that, that are really not congenial to a lot of Hispanic voters, especially working class voters. They're not, you know, they actually don't believe America is a structurally racist white supremacist society. They reject that proposition. They are not enthusiastic about uh, some of the activity of the Democrats around transgender issues. They don't think that uh, biological boys should participate in girls' teams. Uh, they're actually not that interested in the green transition. Uh, they're for uh, wind and solar energy, as everybody else is, but they actually think that there should be uh, a mix going forward of fossil fuels, renewables, nuclear, and so on. So that's just a tip of the iceberg, really, of how a lot of the views of working class Hispanic voters really do depart in important ways from what's pr at least perceived as the center of gravity of the Democratic Party and some of the things the Biden administration has done and said. So long story short, if the Democrats are thinking they can surge back among Hispanics based on Biden having been president for four years, it's a little hard to see that in the data. And in fact, uh, it appears there's a considerable potential for further erosion because Democrats' image um, is just not anymore of being, as it were, the tribune of the working class of all races 
and ethnicities. It's it's become quite different. It's become much more identified with the views of white college educated liberalish people in the coastal enclaves, um, and it adopts a sort of style of uh, rhetoric and pre- presentation that is that is foreign to a lot of these voters, and they're just not sure, you know. To put it bluntly, Democrats have their back. And I think we saw a lot of that in those focus groups, Sarah, that we're going we're gonna, to uh, hear from today. The focus groups were extremely fascinating. Um, I'm excited to, to listen to this because I, I learned a lot from them. And I, I think maybe just to say it's an overall observation, I was just really struck by how much these Hispanic voters yeah. sounded like your average, like two-time Trump voters. Like just, uh, they, I mean, it, it if... If I hadn't known that we were screening for an all Hispanic group, um, I I don't know that I would. They were pretty indistinguishable. Um, but I, you know, one of the key points in your book is that after Barack Obama won re-election in 2012, there was this kind of conventional wisdom that demographics had shifted in the country to such a degree that Democrats were headed for sort of a durable majority, uh, a durable majority. But that hasn't happened, in spite of you know, like everything about Donald Trump, the Republican Party share of Hispanics uh, has just continued to grow on his watch. And so when we talk to these Hispanic voters who didn't vote for 20, didn't vote for Trump in 2016, but did in 2020, and on mm-hmm. this podcast, we often call them reverse flippers. Um, and ah. some of them like didn't even vote in 2016. Some, you know, went third party, some right. voted for Hillary. Uh, but they talked about how they went, how they warmed up to Trump, like how they how they how they learned to love Trump uh, and and the and the Republican Party in general. Let's listen. I couldn't vote in 2016. I would have voted Trump. Mm-hmm. Actually, everybody that I told didn't believe me, like, oh, he's not going to win. And I said, he's going to win because you're underestimating actually the values that the real America has. You know, there are real Americans that love hearing America, that love seeing the flag. I mean, and I used to, when I came on vacation, like, oh, the American flag was such a good thing. And and anybody that's been in the citizenship ceremony should agree with me that every American should go. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. I never thought Trump was going to win. I really thought Bush or whoever, even the... Uh governor from Ohio that was running. I liked him a lot, too. I liked everybody but Donald Trump. I never really thought Donald Trump could be any good. And so I didn't vote for him, and I definitely wasn't voting Democrat. And so I just voted for that guy because I wanted to vote. I've been voting since, you know, I was able to. And now I voted for him in 2020 because he kicked ass. And I thought he was the best president and did great for this country. If I would have had the ability to vote, I might have voted for Hillary. I liked her. Thank God I didn't have the ability to vote at that moment. Um, So then in 2020, I did vote for Trump for several reasons. Not that I liked the guy. I don't. I mean, I'm going to be straight up front. I don't. But I dislike even more the Democrat philosophy. So thanks, but no thanks. So I did vote against not only Biden, I voted against Democrat. On the 2016, I voted for Hillary. Yeah, because when Trump went out and said all those bad things about Mexicans, uh, I lived a long time in Mexico. I love Mexico. I love Mexican people. Obviously, everyone loves Mexican food. So I was shocked, you know. But in 2020, I voted for Trump because he's a businessman. He knew what he was doing, and he did it very well. I mean, when he was president, he did it great. I mean, I was astonished. I was astonished. I I didn't think that I would be a pro-Trump, but I was. And right now, I'm seeing all the stuff that is happening right now, not only economic, but they have, like, an agenda prepared uh, to make all things Spencer and all the corruption that you find in the government and the Congress. Oh, man, it makes you feel like bombing, you know. Okay, so I should note every single person in this uh, reverse flipper group, they plan on voting for Trump again in 2024. They were they are ready for Trump again. Uh, So (laughs) what, what to what do you attribute, Rui? 
Trump's major inroads with Hispanics? Because I hear in these comments, not just, you definitely hear the, I voted against the Democrats. I voted against. Mm-hmm. And you just made a case earlier about why the Democratic Party is alienating some of these people. But there's also like mm-hmm. a real pro-Trump vibe, right? A real like Trump specifically, I, I like him. And I didn't like him before, but now I do. Like, what do you what do you attribute that to? Well, I think uh, we can we can get some of that from from uh, listening to uh, sometimes when, it, uh, when you want to know what people mean, you you listen to what they say. Right. So what they said is, hey, Trump is a straight shooter. He made things work. The economy was really good. He stood up to other countries. You know, he was patriotic. Um, and, you know, I didn't like him to begin with, but but now I like him because he's uh, doing what needs to be done. And he's not just a standard issue politician. Uh, and, and by God, we need more of that kind of thing. So I think that, you know, it's not, it shouldn't be that hard to understand why, if that's your view of the Trump years versus the Biden years, that you would vote for Trump again. And I think it's really interesting to think, Sarah, like, okay, we're listening to this, you know, it's hard not to sort of get it a little bit when you listen to these voters. But I think for most Democrats, uh, this is a foreign country. They, they don't get it. I mean, to, to them, it's just so obvious Trump is awful. And nobody in their right mind with the decent values would vote for him. But that's not the way a lot of working class voters see it, and including working class Hispanics. And until and unless Democrats start to understand that it's actually quite possible for working class voters to like Trump for some reasons that don't have anything to do with them being a stone cold racist reactionary or, you know, Neanderthal troglodyte, then I think they're going to struggle with these voters because these voters not incorrectly, I think, believe that Democrats don't understand them, look down on them and can't understand where they're coming from. And this is these are good examples of, you know, if you listen to these voters, you can see why they got the point of view they do. If you want them to vote for you and not for Trump, you got to make a better case. You can't just say Trump bad, orange man bad. Orange man fascist, you must vote for Democrats because it's not going to work. Okay, so uh, we definitely had some signs from the groups uh, that the reverse flippers (laughs) identify more with the GOP uh, and they consider themselves uh, to have like they consider themselves to have more conservative values. And so they they like identify this cultural decline, which they Uh seem to sort of associate with Democrats. Let's listen. Uh, man, one of the biggest things I've seen is a crisis in morality on the Democrat side. Republicans are not perfect. You know, they got their errors where they fall short. But the Democrat side, um, like some of you were saying, the whole deal with transgenderism, with tolerance, but they won't tolerate to it's not on their side. Things like that. This is a crisis of morality. California, I work in the mortgage industry, so I do loans throughout the U.S. And I just see you know, a difference in where people are buying homes. And there's a good reason for it. That's why I moved to Texas. I was in Florida before, and those are really, really the only two states I've been seeing that are still, you know, holding on to a lot of their Republican values, whereas Washington, Oregon, and California are just in crisis mode right now. People don't care about giving customer service. People just, it's not about just minding their own business. It's about not being friendly, not giving, you know, any thought about anything, about anything. You know, I'm just going to work, clock in, clock out, bye bye, and that's it. But I mean, the social morals are bad. You see every city, I mean, I live in Fort Worth, and Fort Worth is beautiful. But you go to Dallas, which is a Democrat city, and it's terrible. It's ugly, it's dirty, it's smelly, it's like going to New York. So you see it. I mean, they have politics that actually don't work for the people. So, Ray, a big complaint in your book is that Democrats have taken this mix of sort of moderate economics and elite liberal cultural norms, like that's what they've kind of put together, but you would prefer more cultural moderation and liberal economics for the sake of winning elections. Uh, But there are Uh also a lot of voters, Democrats can't afford to lose in 2024, who do want the more fiscally conservative, socially liberal mix. And sort of how do you balance that within the coalition? Well, that's a good question. I actually think the the numbers of people these days who are fiscally conservative and socially liberal is not that large. Um, there's actually much more higher correlation now between social 
social liberalism and economic liberalism, um, that most of, for example, the white college educated liberals who are now the, you know, increasingly a base of the Democratic Party, a burgeoning group who in many ways sets the tone for the party. These are people who are pretty liberal in economics, too. It's just they're super liberal on social issues. And, you know, as a number of studies have established, a lot of these voters uh, are in some ways give, give priority or salience to the, their social liberalism. And they're willing to punish Democrats by voting for other more liberal Democrats in primaries and so on. You don't adhere to these things. And they're certainly willing to go after them on social media and what have you. So my view is that, yeah, I mean, if the Democrats move to the center on cultural issues, discarded some of these outre, super liberal social approaches, uh, and more sounded like normie, <laughs> like they had a normie voter approach to this, they might annoy a lot of these, you know, college educated liberals. But I actually don't believe that these college educated liberals are going to go vote for Donald Trump. Um, there may be some attrition in terms of not voting or voting for a third party candidate, but I think it would, my view at least, it'd be more than made up by doing much better among working class voters because that is where the bulk of the voters are. That's where the Democrats have been losing voters. That's how Trump is going to win if he does win. Um, it just seems to me the, the, the road is clear to taking a different approach to uh, you know the balance of issues in the Democratic Party and how those issues are presented. I mean, cultural moderation is extremely popular. <laughs> Most white college graduates are, are moderates, right? I mean, there, there's a con big contingent that's liberal and they vote like at Soviet levels for the Democrats, but that's not where the action is. And that's not where the voters are likely to move on. And it's certainly true among non-white voters, right? Non-white voters, especially working class voters, are overwhelmingly moderate to conservative. And I think they would welcome uh, the Democratic Party moving away from some of its positions on crime and immigration, on race and gender, uh, on schools and what have you, that they just want, they just want normal, you know, conduct in America. They want ideology out of the schools. They want crime stopped. They want the border control. They want things to be in order. I mean, in a way, we look back at how Biden ran in, in, in 2000, I mean, 2020, it was like, I'm going to restore normality to America. I'm going to get the economy moving and we're going to be normal. You know, everything's going to get back to normal. The problem for the Democrats, to a non-trivial extent at this point, is that people look at the country, <clears throat> you know, under the Democratic administration, and it doesn't seem normal. There was too much inflation. There's too much crime. There's too much disorder in the cities. The border is clearly out of control. The, the culture wars around race and gender are raging, and nobody seems to want to compromise, including the Democrats. And people are sick of it. You know, they're just sick of it. And I think this is this redounds to the benefit, uh, not of the Democrats, but of the other side who can run against the incumbent administration uh, in a way that uh, puts them in a great deal of danger, despite you know the fact that a lot of people really hate Trump. But in fact, if the Republicans ran like Nikki Haley, uh, she might uh, clean up. But if they're going to run Trump, um, you know, he's maybe not their best candidate, but boy, he can take advantage of a lot of this discontent. These voters sort of seem to have the same type of like right wing grievance that's not always steeped entirely in reality. Like the did the culture wars that you just referenced, mm -hmm. like Ron DeSantis is driving a lot of the culture wars. Like Republicans are stoking the culture wars in such a way that uh, makes the train like Joe Biden has never said that he thinks biological males should play women's sports. Uh, and he has never said defund the police. And uh, he has been good on sort of Israel. And so, like, I guess I wonder how much of this is like a real failure of Democrats and how much is it that like rep conservative talk radio and sort of conservative cultural values um, has become like it was clear to me listening to this group that they ingest a lot of right wing media. Like the same way I hear they gave Biden no credit. They said the economy is absolutely awful. Uh, and obviously I hear this from all manner of voters that, you know, inflation is tough. But like I'm not sure that if Joe Biden is sort of culturally moderate and doesn't seem to be winning over these voters. And so I guess I'm wondering how much of it is truly an alienation from ma the mainstream Democrats and how much it is that like these are actually like – 
right wing voters who have moved into a right wing media ecosystem and are just like, that's just the world they're living in now. Well, I mean, I'm always very cautious about trying to attribute people's views to simply, you know, they're manipulated by whatever media that they absorb. I mean, one could make the same argument about liberal views on those social issues or issues in general. I mean, people tend to ingest media that they feel is sympathetic to their point of view, and that me- those media are typically not completely unbiased. So if you want to if you, your view of the culture wars is fundamentally that the conservatives are prosecuting it and the liberals have all the correct positions, you can listen to coverage all day long that will reinforce that because mm-hmm. liberal media will take every single and the most and the craziest views of, of people on the right and amplify them and basically make it sound like the liberal position on X is obviously the correct, tolerant, and humane one. But that might might not be true either. I mean, to my mind, Sarah, I mean, one has to be careful about falling into what we call the Fox News fallacy, where if Fox News is raising an issue about what's going on in the schools or what's going on with crime in the cities or what's going on with immigration at the border. Um, that is, it, this is a meretricious, deceptive meme that's being injected into the body politic by the conservative media. And it just has no real purchase on reality. This is people aren't really upset about stuff that's going on in the real world. They're they're being made to be upset by the conservative media. And we reject that proposition. I think there's a real problems that are going on that real people see and real people are worried about. I mean, just take the issue of transgenderism, which of course is a real hot button issue. Um, the problem is that Biden comes out and says, I think that, you know, biological boys are the same as girls. You know, biological boys who say their girls are the same as girls. It's just that the the slant and practice of his administration of the Democrats who make up his party are like pretty much 100 percent on board with the so-called gender affirming care approach. Right. I mean, this is just true down the line. You'll go to his his assistant surgeon general who said that gender, you know, the whole gender ideology, gender medicine thing is all settled science. Nobody should object to this. Uh, Democrats in states all over the country have basically, in a, it even in a, really, literally laid down the law on this. Um, and, you know, who, who is associated with the view that essentially, you know, gender is self-declared, right? Uh, and that anybody who says they're, you know, they're a boy, say they're a girl, whether well, they're the same as a girl, and or a man who says they're a woman, they're exactly the same, they're treated the same, there should be no uh, biologically sex-segregated spaces, uh, gender affirming medical care should be available pretty much almost on demand to children. I mean, people are really concerned about these issues. And we can argue about what the correct, moderate approach might be to these issues. But it's not just being made up by Fox News. People are upset about this. And Democrats are inevitably and rightly associated with one wing of, of that debate. It doesn't matter that Biden doesn't spend, you know, like, He doesn't give an address every week about how he believes in gender affirming care. His party is inevitably associated. with The same thing is true of issues around crime, around bail reform, around, you know, the sort of harm reduction approach in cities, which results in people openly taking drugs in the middle of uh, city streets. You have mentally ill people on the street. Uh, It doesn't matter that Biden says he's for controlling the border when New York is getting 600 additional migrants a day and they're freaking out because they can't take care of these people. I mean, we saw that in some of those Hispanic focus groups, people who lived in and around New York complaining yeah, yeah. about, no. about the actually, migrant situation being out of control. So yeah. I just think, Sarah, we have to be very careful I'm about get describing to your Fox these News fallacy. views to simply being manipulated by the conservative media. So, OK, so I'm going to get to the Fox News fallacy specifically. We can pick this part back up. Uh, okay. And now I'm going to but to get back to the like to your point broadly, which I, I think I agree with. Broadly, although I think sometimes I think sometimes I would disagree with like the level of emphasis. Um, Fair enough. But let's talk about the term Latinx uh, mm-hmm. because this is one that's like a personal annoying one for me, uh, <clears throat> and that's a, a term that's definitely a symptom of the elite cultural norms that you, you're discussing here, uh, and one in which the voters in our groups were kind of perplexed by. Uh, so let's listen to how they thought about Latinx and how they think too much tokenization is creeping in around these identity politics. I don't know what it means. Me either. <laughs> Same. I saw that on a thing that I was filling out. I was like, what is in Latinx? I mean, the Democrat Party, all that is divide and conquer. 
divide and conquer by whoever, women, with men, with trans, with gays, with uh, black, with Latinos. I mean, they tried to apply it to Latinos with the Latinx stuff. And we were like, you're not Latinx, we're Latinos. I mean, don't put me any other name or any other box because it's not going to work with us. Why don't you say Hispanic? It doesn't have an O or an A. Yeah, it's stupid. Uh, stupid. No, no stupid. stupid. No, stupido. It's stupid. I just feel that they're targeting, just like they targeted Blacks, you know, because even in schools, I mean, you, you kind of have to know Spanish now for the younger people because there's a lot of Hispanics in the United States now. We're almost approaching, I'd say, 40, 60 percent population. I just feel that they're targeting and they use Hispanics as a ploy in the Democratic Party. When we were doing this group, uh, we asked them how they felt about being a sort of sought after demographic in politics. Uh, and we we actually heard concerns about too much homogenization. One Democratic voter said they were from South America. Others were from Mexico. But they said they see us all as brown, uh, meaning that a, a wide range of cultures from different countries are lumped together into being Hispanic. Uh, and the progressive theory of the case does seem to be that you can win these voters over basically by playing to identity politics. Um, so how can groups that want to win these win these kinds of voters back speak broadly to to Hispanics without falling into this trap, or can they not? Well, what would be wrong with uh, taking a universalistic, colorblind approach to social policy? What would be wrong with what the Democratic Party has traditionally stood for, which is anti-discrimination, tolerance, and uplift for working and middle-class people of all races. What would be wrong with that? Why is there a necessity to promote and in any way endorse identity politics? This makes no sense to me. We can see from the way Hispanics react to this that this is, this is not how they think of themselves. I mean, I've written in various places, I think the Democrats made a huge mistake lumping in Hispanics with so-called people of color and assuming that, like all people of color, they feel oppressed by being non-whites in a white supremacist society, and they're victims of structural racism, and really that's what they care about. They care about the fact that they're oppressed as non-whites. That's not what they care about. Hispanics are a hardworking, upwardly mobile, patriotic constituency who cares mostly about their kids, their community, having a decent job, getting health care. I mean, this is what they care about. They're, they're not sitting around like, they don't get up in the morning and think, oh my God, I live in this dystopian hellhole called the United States where I'm the victim of structural racism. That's not remotely close to how they think about the world. And I think, you know, it's time to go back to the future. Democrats have had their greatest success when they were viewed as and were the party of the people, of the common man and woman in America, without, you know, seeing fracturing people into identity groups. Now, that has been, you know, at times it's been hard to do this, right? There's been many times, ball has been dropped in many ways. America has both a good and a bad aspects to its history. But that is no excuse for giving up on universalistic norms of uplift, of anti-discrimination, of we're all, we're all Americans. You know, the, the Albert Murray and R Ralph Ellison, you know, promulgated this term a long time ago called omni-Americans. We're all Americans. We're, we're a mix of all kinds of different cultural and other influences. And that's great. But we're all part of one country. And we all have the, you know, we're all in this together, as it were. Um, and we should basically emphasize what we have in common, not what we don't. Um, so I think that, again, historically, that was a Democratic Party brand and the brand that's associated with the greatest success. And I think it's been a tragedy that Democrats have discarded this potent weapon and this potential unifying force. So uh, in the book, your book, uh, one problem you lay out for Democrats losing working class voters is that they're resistant to policies that will reduce illegal immigration and are supportive of bringing a lot of what you call unskilled workers into the country. Mm -hmm. Our reverse flipper group had some strong feelings on immigration policy and who should be com coming into the country uh, and when. Let's listen. I had a friend that he lives in Japan. I remember that he told me something that it really made my mind like start thinking in a different way and he told me like in japan if you want to go to japan and stay there you have to do it in the right way i mean you have to go there ask for a permit learn the language and everything because that's the respectful way to do it i'm originally from venezuela too and i've seen socialism taking over i saw it taking over venezuela i saw it happening in colombia i saw it happening in chile and brazil america was the last freedom standing in the world it was ugh, the country everybody wanted to go. 
I'm pissed, even with the quantity of Venezuelans that are coming through the border and the quality of the Venezuelans that are coming on the border. Even me being Venezuela, I'm, I'm not afraid of saying it. It's wrong. The quality of people is terrible because it's the people raised by this communist party. I don't know if you've seen a lot of immigration people come there yet, the immigrants, but we are seeing a lot of panhandlers now who cannot speak English. Now, I think on a, an American-based citizen part, they're throwing things at them. I don't think that's right. Um, I think we need Trump back. I think he had us going the right way, even though he was kind of blunt. And I never thought I would vote for him, but I did. So like I said at the top, Trump's immigration talk in 2016 was thought to be poisoning the well uh, for the GOP with Hispanic voters. Uh, what is the conventional wisdom missing about some Hispanics' views on immigration? Because I got to tell you, these Hispanics groups, this was the thing that blew me the way the most. They were anti-immigration. Like, they, they, they were, they were, and I mean, they actually, they sound a lot like other Republican voters where they're like coming, mm -hmm. they talk about coming the right way. Um, but they have a lot of negative feelings about too many people coming into the country. Right. Yeah, I mean, well, this is uh, the other aspect of uh, Democrats. I mean, it's related to the Democrats' mistake about, well, let's just all think of those people of color, this undifferentiated blob and all this stuff. So, um, they assumed they're immigration voters, right? I mean, this was sort of, this was part of the, the mantra after 2012 was that, you know, we did so well among Hispanics, they're part of the burgeoning American majority, um, and they are, you know, voters who are really, you know, on the side of, and they're on our side because, uh, you know, we're on the side of immigrants. Therefore, Democrat should stand for <clears throat> the uh, maximally, you know, tolerant approach to immigration. And uh, we don't want to say anything that might imply we're going to harden people who are trying to come into the country or illegal immigrants of any kind. And we saw that in 2016 and onward, where the Democrats start really talking about border security. They started referring to Obama as the deporter in chief. And that the theory of all this was that because Hispanics are you know, from an immigrant background, depends on the generation how far back, but, you know, they're, they live in communities where a lot of immigrants, they were immigrants themselves at one point, perhaps. I mean, because of that, they will vote on the basis of immigration. And the immigration policy they want is a lax, open, tolerant approach. And I just, it's just not the case. I mean, these are Hispanic citizens we're talking to who can vote. They've gone through the mill. They've been here for a while and who knows how long, but their families may go back a while, but their view on America is America is a land of opportunity where people should come here and take advantage of it, work hard, do it the right way. And the idea that you should be able to stroll across the border, declare asylum, and then be bused somewhere else and uh, receive social services and the like, and maybe even have access to a job, it's just, it doesn't compute for them. That's not the way they feel they live their life. That's not the way, what they feel America is about. And so it's just been a colossal mistake to think if Democrats want to continue receiving the majorities they do among Hispanics and build those majorities, they must continue to have a very lax, open immigration policy. And they don't want to say much about border security because, you know, as the famous yard sign says, no human being is illegal, right? So, I mean, this is a kind of, frankly, baloney that has... Uh, you know, become quite popular in democratic activist circles, including a lot of the advocacy groups that purport to speak on, uh, you know, in the name of Hispanics. Uh, and, but that I think when you drill down to what actual, you know, existing voters think who are Hispanic, they do not have those points of view. They do not think the border should be relatively uncontrolled. They do think people should come in the right way. They aren't for a lot more illegal immigration. Now they may be for people being treated humanely at the border, uh, you know, when they're encountered, that that's fine. They may believe that there's a need for something to be done for the immigrant, illegal immigrants already in the country. There needs to be, say, some sort of path to citizenship or some sort of reform that would move us in that direction. That could all be true, but that doesn't mean they don't want border security and a crackdown on people who are basically gaming the system and coming into the country and doing it the wrong way. Like this yeah. is just a the standard point of view that a lot of these voters have, and I think Democrats ignore to their peril. Yeah, so it's so standard that actually I want to give you a quick taste of another group we talked to for this show. So these are Hispanic voters who voted for Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, but who mm -hmm. are undecided about 2024. And 
they brought up immigration policy a lot as one of the reasons why they were undecided. Let's listen. To me, this is mainly the result of like COVID and all the inequalities that it brought up to the surface that were already there, but now they're just more prevalent. I don't think this is Biden. Yeah, I don't think he's handled it correctly, but this would have happened with any other president. This is years in the making. The fact that they haven't had some type of immigration reform in like decades is just ridiculous. But at the same time, open borders just doesn't work anymore. I mean, I am an immigrant myself and so is my entire family. So for me to say this, it actually pains me, but they need to draw the line at some point. If this cannot continue to happen. I think Mexico is just taking advantage of this policy that they're just sending these derelicts over. And, you know, in the 80s, when I, like I said, I immigrated my cousin and I had to put up $5,000. Back then, it was a lot of money. But his stipulations was that he was going to be a businessman. He was going to be an asset to us. The only reason I would ever entertain the idea of voting for Trump is because during the Trump administration for border crossing, there was maybe around like 30 people coming a month. Now the number is well within the thousands coming a month. And that's not fair for those who are trying to immigrate to this country, following the laws of applying. It is just wild to me to hear so many people talk about like, well, we needed the border wall and Mexicans are, you know, not sending their best. And uh, I, I understand, I understand sort of saying, you know, boy, as somebody who went through the immigration process myself, like it's pretty messed up and let's talk about it. But they are, what they're specifically saying is they do not like uh, the Democrats oh policy of like, letting more people in uh, or like what they perceive to be open borders, which Joe Biden does not have an open borders policy. Um, I, I mean, to me, again, I I'm, I promise this like next we're going to get into some of the um, the the Fox News stuff. But like, I don't know, they do just sound like right wing. They I, they sounded I was blown away by these statements and 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 who they were coming from. Like for somebody being like, I'm Venezuelan. Don't let any more Venezuelans in. Like, what do you make of this? Well, I think one way to think about it is to cast our mind back to our minds back to uh, debates about immigration policy in the past in like the 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, most people today don't realize it. Um, don't remember or would never have experienced it, but the traditional Democratic Party position on immigration was actually pretty tough. That immigration was perceived, if it's uncontrolled, as putting downward pressure on wages, as putting pressure on social services, and it was not at all in the interest of the working class to allow, you know, very lax, have lax immigration policy. That if people come into the country illegally and they're working, there should be an e-verify system. The Jordan Commission was all over this, right? I mean, it's not that long ago that the Democrats' policy started departing from, you know, the idea borders have to be strictly controlled. We have to really contain illegal immigration. There's illegal immigration. We should try to do something about it in terms of the people in the country who have jobs who are here illegally. I mean, there was a whole, you know, effort to to regularize the immigration system, to bring it under control, but it kind of basically got blown up in the in, in the in the two thousands. Um, and the Democratic Party itself changed its position, where it was no longer so concerned with stopping illegal immigration. It was concerned with, um, you know, sort of what do we do with the people already here? We need a big reform on that. Uh, this was not the labor position and not the Democratic position until relatively recently. And look, we don't <laughs> just go back to the Obama administration. They had a much tougher position on immigration than Democrats do today. There's just no question that the Biden policies and approach to the immigration the immigration policy once they took over clearly was more laxer than the Trump approach. It clearly sent a signal uh, to people who wanted to come here and tons of people want to come here that, you know, the, basically the the administration tried to present it as we're going to be more human humanitarian. We're going to be nicer. But the way that was, the signal was read across Latin America and Central America and a lot of other places was if you come, it will be easier to get in. 
And that turned out to be true. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this is not to the liking of most Americans at this point, including a lot of Hispanics, including especially working class Hispanics who don't see it in their interest to have what seems to be a quasi, at least, open, open border. Um, and I think Democrats just need to accept that, that people really do want border security. There is almost no, there is a very small constituency in this country for quasi open border, or basically the policy they currently have. I mean, that's why Biden has a 23% rating on handling border security. The, the real constituency for let them all come is basically white college educated liberal Democrats. That's a constituency. It isn't Hispanics at this point. It's the people who are most liberal in the Democratic Party who have essentially adopted a dogma that you know borders should essentially be be as open as possible, and we should make it as easy as possible to immigrate here. And if they're here, we have to take care of them, and so on. Whereas, of course, no country in the world, you know, has uncontrolled borders. No country in the world thinks it's okay for people to come, you know, if they want and just hang out and then get services and so on. So, I mean, again, back to being, you know, back to being a spokesman for the ordinary American, for the normie American. Uh, what the Democrats are doing in immigration isn't that. And we see that in, again, in these focus groups of people who, you know, some of them are obviously very sympathetic to the Democrats who just, who just don't buy it and who are Hispanic, supposed to be the virgin constituency for the Democratic Party uh, moving forward. So, um, I think Democrats, I made this argument and I'll make it time and again, and I'll make it time and again in the future. They need to really cut bait with a lot of the people who push a lot of these positions on these issues, like immigration. They're not popular, not substantively workable, and are a drag on their political prospects, uh, including what we're talking about here, about us with Hispanic voters. So easy yeah. to say, harder to do, I realize. Well, I mean, look, we could do a whole hour or day or lots and lots of time on immigration. I, I, I do feel strongly uh, as somebody who is I am I am pro immigration uh, for the United States of America. I think that immigration has been it's like the thing that we do here. Uh, it's how we've built this country uh, aside from early on when people were brought here against their will. Um, but I like I am proud of the fact that we lots of people want to come here. I've always taken that as a positive. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need a system that allows people to come here where it doesn't take, you know, 15 years to become an American citizen. And we know who's in the country and we do have borders. And it feels like mm -hmm. this is one of those issues that both sides have just become committed to not solving and like kicking the can down the road and nobody wants to actually do the work. But I know you and I have been in a lot of rooms together where I, I make this case as well, that Democrats do not realize how vulnerable they are in immigration. Um, and they really, I think it's one of the things that people don't realize that this was what made Trump, uh, that just accelerated him to the top. The extent to which the wall, which is like, it was, the wall was just sort of like a metaphor for taking immigration seriously and making it mm -hmm. a, um, a central part of the campaign. Uh, and that is what people were attracted to. And like the thing about talking, saying like immigration stuff broadly is that there is a nativist cohort. There is a cohort that that has like racial reasons for not liking mm -hmm. it. But then there's also sort of a broad normie middle that is just like, well, obviously we should have borders and obviously we should know who's in the country and mm -hmm. you can't just let people pour across the border. And that is true of Hispanic voters and I do think this is something Democrats are going to have to grapple with. I don't think they realize the electoral price that it is costing them uh, to seem derelict on the border. I agree. And I think to you, so I finally on this Fox News fallacy, we have this in the in the in our like script here to talk about it mm -hmm. specifically in relation to the Democrat, the Democratic Hispanics who these guys are not watching Fox News. Like I listen to the the reverse flippers who were voting for Trump. I think these guys are watching a lot of Fox News. Mm -hmm. I did not think uh, or listening to a fair amount of right wing media. I think a lot of like right wing talk radio is like going on in 
places like Miami and other places with like big, large Hispanic populations. Um, that said, like the Hispanic Dems aren't, that's not, I think what they're immersed in. And they still had a lot of concerns about the border. I think you've kind of already articulated your Fox news fantasy, but, or Fox mm-hmm. news fallacy, but um, I do agree that I listen to Dems often just reach for Fox news as an explanation for everything. And like, only a few million people are watching Fox news. Like a lot of times, like it's not, you really can't blame everything on it. And it does, I think discount the lived experience of a lot of people uh, who are frustrated about things that like Democrats don't really want them to be frustrated about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, again, the most parsimonious explanation for why typically people might have, you know, view X is that, that this is how, They interpret their own experience, the things they've heard, you know, what's going on in their community or the city that's near them or their state. Um, People are complex and they have complex ways of processing information. Some rely on Fox News. Most people don't. Um, But people's opinions, by and large, on big issues like this are driven by the realities of the world around them and how they choose to interpret it. Now, Democrats may look at the same events and have a very different or loyal Democrats, partisan Democrats, like, you know, my sort of prototypical white college educated liberal Democrat will look at the same data, as it were, and have a very different conclusion. But, uh, you know, these other voters, they may look at what's going on at the border and they say, with you know, basically, people have been pouring across the border. It's just a fact. People have been pouring into all kinds of different areas of the country and are you know, causing social disorder and, you know, just nobody knows what to do with them. And people look at that and say, what the hell? Um, this is a real problem. So they don't need Fox News to tell them, that, even though Fox News may cover it. And, you know, one might add at this point that just like it's the case that, you know, Fox News may not cover some things that make Republicans look really bad, and but it will be covered on MSNBC. Uh, and therefore, you know, if you want information about X, Uh, You might want to look at MSNBC. The same thing is true of Fox News. Fox News will cover things that, you know, a lot of the sort of center left media will not. Um, And therefore, you know, again, this is providing people with data. It's not all bias. (laughs) It's not all bias all the way down. It's on either side. There's always glimmers of truth, facts that are being reported, things that are being put into the, you know, the complex machine that is the views of ordinary people on, on big issues. And it, I think it's just really lazy for a lot of Democrats to, of course, it makes them feel good, right? I mean, why do people believe this crazy stuff? Why don't they like us Democrats? It's Fox News. They're just being lied to. It's disinformation. They're being manipulated. Otherwise, they would see how great we are. So I think this is just stupid, really. I think it's, and it shows a real misunderstanding of people and how they make up their minds and a certain contempt almost. Uh, here's where, I mean, Fox news is full of garbage and poison. Uh, I mean like the, the extent to which, uh, I mean, just take the election. I mean, and, and to be clear, a bunch of the, uh, I don't think we've got it in here, but a bunch of the sort of reverse flippers, uh, the 2020 Trump voters, they all thought the election was stolen. That's a lie. It's a lie that Fox news perpetrates. Um, Uh, that's trash. I'm just saying everything on Fox news isn't made up. Uh, some things are, some things aren't, right? So it's like any other news source. I mean, Fox News is particularly egregious on some, in some aspects, but it's just not the case that everything on Fox News is a completely made-up, meretricious story about some awful thing the Democrats never really did. Just like it's true on MSNBC, that not everything on MSNBC that sounds terrible for the Republicans is made up, though occasionally it might be, right? So, look, I'm not... I'm not here to defend Fox News as a great news source that we should all listen to religiously and believe everything it said. All I'm saying is that, you know, Fox News, like a lot of conservative media, covers some things that the left media will not. And there's there's truth content in there, times that is digested by the people who who watch it and then is disseminated out. So um, I just I really I just refuse to take the position that Nothing on Fox News is true and everything that's true, everything that's on MSNBC is. I just don't think that's the way the world works. And again, I think it shortchanges 
the complicated way in which people digest information and make so up their minds about things. I don't think you have things. to create. I mean, I, I don't think you have to create a parody on mm-hmm. between Fox News and MSNBC to sort of acknowledge that the media that people are immersed in, their mm-hmm. media silos make a big difference. And the extent to which they are imbibing right-wing media, if not Fox News, like Fox News is just one thing. Sure, I think that absolutely. part of the issue with Fox News is that people reach for it all the time when actually there's just – like there's a whole yeah, a um, network of talkers out there, mm-hmm. many of them Hispanic too. Mm-hmm. Who, sure. who, like there's Spanish right-wing talk radio now uh, and – that is just a – that is clearly in here. And I, I want to get to this, this last segment mm-hmm. uh, because this is the part that actively made me angry. And I want to know what you think about it. Um, okay. So this group of reverse flippers, uh, which to me was just a really wild group. So we heard a couple people and they were talking about how terrible things were in America. There was mm-hmm. a lot of like it's so bad here. And they were saying it was so bad. They, they were considering leaving the United States, a country oh, yeah, that many of them this, uh... chose to immigrate to. Let's listen. And I think we're a joke with other countries. And I don't know what's going on, but I have a bad feeling. I think we have been infiltrated through the southern border, not with just good people, but I think they have planted cells in this country. And I don't know what's going to happen, but it's scary. Scary times now. I think a lot of people are leaving the country because of that. Mm-hmm. I have friends moved to Spain and loving it there, Italy. I got family in Colombia, so now even Colombia is starting to look better, even though they have a bad government down there too. So, Colombia. My wife and I already have our minds made up. I mean, it's not going to be right now, but we know that our retirement is not going to be in this country. Is going to be either in Spain or in Italy. Sadly, it's not going to be in Venezuela, which we would love, but it's not. But it will be in Spain or mm-hmm. Italy for sure. Not here, because the way things are going, no thanks. Okay. So this uh, this was like, and it was the kind of the whole group, just super dark view of the United States. And uh, that is Trump's view. So Trump has a mm-hmm. super dark view of the United States. This is a bad place. And I got to tell you, my conservatism literally right. springs as a young person from the idea that America is a good place. And I didn't like hearing Democrats talk about it. Like we were always the bad guys because I thought America as an idea, the American idea was awesome. And I thought it was awesome that immigrants wanted to come here. And my mom came over here uh, on no, a boat. Sir. Now it was from England. It was called the queen Mary, but it was, uh, you know, I just, she had an immigrant zeal for the United. There was like Americana all over our house, at the signing of the declaration of independence and stuff. Uh, and so I just, it feels, it felt striking to me to listen to people who had immigrated to the United States, talk about it, not being a great place anymore. And like, they wanted to leave. Is this a, is this common? Is this a thing that is out there now? Well, sure. I mean, we know it is from listening to these voters. We know that, as you say, I mean, Trump is a very dark view of America. There's a very dark view of America uh, among a lot of Republicans, particularly the sort of hardcore uh, Trumpists who feel like we're just one step away from, you know, very, you know, the communists taking over. The Democrats are, are I mean, never going to leave office. Dem- Democrats are never going to leave office. Well, yeah, I know it's silly, but there it is. People believe all Trump's kinds of Trump's the one who stuff. wouldn't leave office. Uh, yeah, okay, fine. I mean, I'm, look, I'm, I'm not... I, people have a right to their views, as crazy as they may be. Um, and maybe the Democrat should think twice about promulgating the view that where this is like the Weimar Republic 1932, and we're on the verge of a total fascist takeover by the MAGAites. I mean, basically, they're arguing we're in a very dark place, too. Right. I mean, their view is like we're one step, one micro step away from fascism. Maybe a better approach to dealing with the anti-democratic impulses of people in and around the Republican Party is by promulgating, as you say, a more positive view of America about how it's a great place to be. Its best days are ahead of it. Self system's quite resilient. We beat back the challenges in 2020. We'll beat them back again. Uh, And in fact, um, you know, let's actually. Return to a kind of America where everybody's proud to be an American and everybody pulls together and not divided and micro-diced into a thousand different slices. 
uh, I think that's a more attractive view than saying, on the one hand, you know, the Trumpists are saying we're one step away from a, you know, democratic dystopia, and Democrats say we're one step away from a fascist dystopia run by Trump and his kids or something. So maybe, you know, maybe just maybe there is an opening here for taking a more optimistic, you know, view of America and its resilience and its potential and not basically just getting down in the mud with the Trumpist Republicans and say, yeah, yeah, you think we're, you know, you, you think we're in this dark place. Well, you're right. We're in a dark place. It's just you're the ones causing the dark place. You're the ones that are taking us one step away from fascism. Look, I mean, Joe Biden went down to Georgia after the relatively anodyne voting reform law was passed, which didn't turn out that had a zero effect on voting in Georgia. He went down there and said, this is Jim Crow 2.0. This is like Bull Connor on the on the bridge in Alabama. I mean, this is this is just silly stuff. Maybe it's time for everybody to damp down the rhetoric, right? And sort of emphasize, you know, what we have in common and the resilience of the system and not basically be so concerned with calling out the other side as being the agents of of the, the coming dystopia. So end of rant, but I think that that I think would be closer to what most Americans want to hear than what I hear coming from either party. Yeah, I agree with that. I remember those comments from Joe Biden. I was really disappointed in them at the time. I will say that I would say on the whole, Joe Biden uh, does present more of an optimistic uh, view of America. I think he tries to. Um, and I think he's Well, you tried- brought up the Biden thing before, Sarah. And I think that there's no question that Biden, you know, in his heart and probably his instincts is a pretty, you know, ultra the moderate guy in some ways. And he is sort of an optimistic old school Democrat, but he can't separate himself from his party. That's the problem. Biden is not the party. It's more like the party is Biden, I think, at this point. And I think that unless Biden clearly, and I've made this argument, clearly took some steps to signal a decisive break with the loonies in his own party and the cultural radicals and the people who do and say stupid things, it just is not going to make that much impression on the media and vote that he's, you know, the Democratic Party is that much different. He is basically, you know, he's like, as I've said it in, in a few things, I mean, he's a designated normie of the Democratic Party. He's the guy who we yeah, can all and he point won. to and say, he's- like, but, but he, but he was, he was elected, like, this is the thing. I just, like, the Republicans, I'm, I'm watching, I'm sitting outside watching, you know, almost 200 Republicans, 200 yesterday, vote Ooh. for Jim Jordan for Speaker of the House. Right. The uh, Donald Trump is up by like a gajillion points over everybody else. And the only other people in spitting distance are imit- carbon copy imitations of Donald Trump. Uh, uh-huh. And, you know, Joe Biden, normie. Uh-huh old guy won the democratic nomination and you can say he's captured by the far left. But like, I don't know. I haven't seen him try to pack the courts. I haven't well, seen I him think try he's to captured uh, by the party as a whole, not by the far left. I just think the left has I just, a lot I of this, sway over the party at this point. That is I not sh- good. Yeah. I mean, I share many of your critiques of sort of the far left. I just, I think, I think I feel like they're overstated, mm-hmm. uh, because I, I, I do think that Joe Biden has like he was a real compromise consensus uh, candidate. I think it's overstated the idea that he's like governing as some crazy like I do think he embodies the thing that you say you want, which is a kind of uh, cultural moderation and uh, economic liberalism. I mean, there's like he is much to the much to the center of just about every other Democrat who ran for president. And that's who the Democratic Party chose. So I just see the Democratic Party broadly making better choices than I see the Republican party making. Um, that being said, mm-hmm. I share one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, uh, is that I think it is deeply important that Democrats understand how to win. I think it is deeply important that they understand, uh, that to attract back working class voters like Joe Biden narrowly won in 2020 in large part because he was able to lose less badly with uh, some Mm -hmm. of these working class voters and Mm -hmm. he's struggling with them. He's struggling with working class voters of color uh, and Hispanics. And like, they're going to have to figure out what to do about that in the next year. uh, If we're going to keep Trump from holding office. So I, I appreciate your perspective and I'm glad you shared it so candidly um, because I think, I think there's going to be a fair number of people here who don't like it, but it's backed up to some degree by what we just heard from these voters and what I heard. And even I was caught off guard a little bit. I do a lot of Hispanic groups, but I hadn't done Mm -hmm. 
Um, I hadn't recently done one of these reverse flipper Hispanic groups. And when I was listening to it, I went, wow, that is something. Um, and so I think you just have to, we can not, we can think it's not good that this is what people are saying. We can try to identify the reason that they're saying it. We can say it's right wing media doesn't change the fact that it's what they think. And so like the question is, is, um, even if, even if we're sure they're wrong about these things, like, okay, Democrats have got to find a way to appeal to these voters and, and how do they do that? And I think that's, that's like going to be a big part of the struggle and uh, sure. over the next piece. So Rui Teixeira, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to all of you for listening to the Focus Group podcast. We'll be back next week with an episode you really don't want to miss. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs>